that. There. Okay. You guys are okay? Showa. Showa. Yeah, the next one is, I think the, we've done that two of those, so we've got a couple more. The next two quizzes deal with uh, civil rights. So the two chapters on civil rights. So there'll be some overlap uh, and some of the things that we've got going on over the next several lessons. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Oh, by the way, I'm doing a recording for this. Um, pretty much wrapping up with the seniors because they're getting those guys ready to uh, take their exams, which they'll do for history uh, starting the first week in May. So that stuff, actually, the 12th grade content is on my YouTube channel now, starting from the beginning of this year all the way through. Um, these last several days with the seniors, we're um, doing practice exams in class. Okay, so we've covered all the content. That's just an FYI, um, in case that's a resource that you felt like you wanted to tap into in the future. Um, with my juniors, we've actually, I'm not going to be making any more videos for those guys. Um, it just turned out nicely because last year when we went um, online during the quarantine, we were actually halfway through Schindler's List. We were doing World War II unit, the Holocaust, and so everything I've got on there plus what I did for this uh, year is on YouTube. Granted, if you're in these seats next year. Um, you'll get it straight from moi as far as like that content, the 11th grade content. Um, but that is there. And then I'm continuing. We still have two students at home. And plus it also help, is helpful in case you're gone for whatever reason. You're able to watch that, um, that YouTube video. Okay? You have a question? I do. It was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hello. You did, didn't you? All of you. All of my 10th grade students. You go, well, everybody in this class. Does my other section count? <laughs> I don't know. Actually, sometimes, yeah, when I was doing the retakes in the past, the quizzes, they would, they would memorize the, it's like, that's just stupid, so, yeah. Oh, okay, really, okay. So in here, uh, take out the, uh, the civics handout thing and so forth. I'm going to walk you through this. I'll give you some background. Um, in case you don't know this already, I may have mentioned it to you before, um, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, there, are some cer there are certain graduation requirements that involve standardized tests. ISATs. You have to have passing scores on your ISAT test in order to graduate in the state of Idaho. Well, what kinds of subject matter do you are you tested on in ISATs? Uh, math, math, English, and science, I think? Yeah. With social studies, they haven't done that because it's always kind of problematic because you're doing social studies content at various different times, depending on what school district you're in uh, throughout your high school career. And frankly, some of the stuff that's most critical is often done like in most high schools, like senior year. For example, government class. If you were to be among those students who in the past uh, joined the ranks of the students who in the past had left North Star after completing, say, 10th grade, um, I always encourage them, you know, take the, the strongest classes you can in the high schools that you're going to. Well, one of the things I definitely encourage them is, like, make sure they don't make you take government over again because government's a two-year require a two-semester, excuse me, requirement for graduation in the state of Idaho. Y'all have it, will take, have it taken care of this year. But most other high schools do that senior year. Same thing with econ. Uh, you guys are taking a full year of econ. You know, hello, which is awesome. Uh, it's a half a year requirement for state for this for graduation, and that is done mostly senior year. Yeah, mostly senior year. So I mean, every once in a while, you guys are like, I don't want to give you any ideas, but sometimes you'll have students who have done like the first couple years of high school at North Star, and then they end up at Eagle or you know whatever um, Rocky or something like that. Um, you have to do four years of English, but by the time they get through their senior year, they might have wrapped up all of their like social studies stuff at least. So, in any event, 
it's harder to test on that. Um, as far as like the ISATs, there really is no ISAT for it, but then there were some legislators that were like, but uh, civics, social studies content is very important. I agree, it's very important, that's what I teach, right? Not that the other stuff isn't. But what did they, what did they do? Here's, what, here's their solution. There was already a test in existence having to do with social studies. It's the test you have to take if you want to become a U.S. citizen. Now, if you're born in this country, you're automatically given citizenship, right? It's constitutional, right? But if you come over to this country, like my mom, and want to become a naturalized citizen, become a U.S. citizen, is that you? Yeah. Okay, do you know when you're, what your process, where are you in the process? I'm not here long enough to take it. So you can't, you're, you'll have to take the exam. Yeah. All right, that's perfect, right? And it's not that crazy hard. Um, in fact, the reality is the biggest thing that they'll do with uh, people as far as naturalization process is make sure they know the English language really well. That's going to be an important thing. I think I might. Okay, I think you're going to be okay. <laughs> I, uh, and then they also do an oral exam. We're not going to do an oral exam for you on this content. And what they'll do is there's a hundred different items, right? I mean, I get this straight off of the uh, 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 Secretary of State's website, right? Um, there's a hundred different items. Have you, are you, have you seen any of this before? Okay, so there's a hundred different items, and then they'll like set up an interview with you, and they'll ask like 20 questions. So they'll just pick 20 questions and so forth. So I don't know if you prefer the oral exam. You don't have that option. For the state of Idaho, we've come up with, because uh, you're required to pass it in the state of Idaho in order to graduate. And North Star is up to just slightly to a, at least a 70%, which is really very, very doable. In fact, I anticipate most of you guys when you take this exam on Thursday, April the 29th, you will get at least a 70%. Most of you guys will get at least an 80%, and many of you will get at least a 90%, because it's not that hard. It's set up as a multiple choice test, okay? Yep, it's set up as a multiple choice test. It was interesting because the first time they said you have to have it passed, but they didn't give a template. And so the first time I did it was like made it a fill in the blank, which is kind of a mess because when it's fill in the blank, what did Ben Franklin do? I mean, hello. I mean, good grief. Yeah, no kidding. Let me see. Actually, where is the Ben Franklin one? Because that's item number, oh, number 68. If you look at 68 and you look at Ben Franklin, I'm sure some of you guys can add to that list of what is he famous for, right? And as far as like electricity and, you know, the stove and all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's so many different things. Needless to say, it was really hard for me when I did the uh, uh, fill-in-the-blank one because it's sort of like, eh. Anyway, uh, West Data ultimately came up with a standardized multiple-choice exam. And so when I was gone, um, the teacher who took my place, yes, I'm Darcy, she took it and she kind of tweaked it in some, and I've tweaked it since then. So some of them are really, really easy as far as, like, Matt, uh, uh, multiple choice, but they're doable, right? So you don't have to remember how to spell certain things, but you do need to know, um, you know, you need to know the answer. Yeah, there is, there's one right answer for each of the different questions, and there's three wrong answers. Yeah, you can narrow it down. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing with, like, pretty much all standardized tests. You know, there's no error for, like, Actually, they even changed some of the standardized tests. Usually, they would ding you for like writing the wrong answer, uh, you know, like a, a, a quarter of a point or something. Now they just sort of like say, ah, whatever, just guess, you know, give it a shot. Yeah. I will tell you because I was going to tell you in any event, and actually. It was weird because I was all set to do that with last year's 10th grade. We do it in the 10th grade because it seems kind of an opportune time, even though there's some of the content that will be covered next year, and even some of that content covered in the senior year as far as, like, you know, Cold War stuff. Uh, but it's not that hard, as you'll see as you go through, that you can't easily put it to memorization, okay? So last year um, we weren't able to do it because COVID. So I had the juniors do it at the beginning of their junior year. And there were two that came up like a percentage point short of 70%. So they redid it. You have an infinite number of times you can redo it. I give you an ins 
here's the incentive for you wanting to get it done really well the first time. It's worth 25 points. So there's 100 questions, and each of them are worth 0.25, OK? So that's so like that week that we do it, you've got a quiz. And one of my quizzes, I think that's a 15-point uh, chapter quiz. You'll take care of that on Tuesday, come in Thursday, and you'll have this all ready to go for a multiple choice test. And if you come in below 70%, we will set up a time for you next year to take it again. So that I tell, yeah, so that I can tell Mr. Pettit, you know, ting, check off this box. You have met your graduation requirement with respect to the civics exam. And it's not that hard. And you can keep, you can keep track of Ivan as far as like when he actually does his. Uh, do you have to be like 18 or older? You don't think so? Huh. Okay. I didn't know if that was like, you know, when you become an adult and you can d make a decision over what to do with your entire life and your citizenship and yada, yada, yada. Okay. Because right now you're a citizen of? Russia. Of Russia. There we go. And your parents are citizens of? Russia. Well. So maybe you'll take it at the same time. Just have a big, like, woohoo party. And be like, I can vote now. Yeah? What's that? Yeah, you're legally here. Yeah, you're legally here. Yeah, I think so. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to, yeah, quick question. I'm going to walk you through this very, very quickly so that you just sort of understand kind of the layout of this. And basically, sit this down to memorization. There will be one question for each of the different items in that order. Yes? That's an interesting thing. Could Ivan just sort of go, I've already done this. Yeah. Um, it's not that hard. I mean, crazy. It's really not that hard. Okay. No, it won't, actually. It won't take the whole class period. No, it's actually going to go very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it is 100 questions. It'll be like ding, 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 ding. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's not a big essay. All right, take a look at uh, page one. Okay, page one, we've got principles of American democracy. Uh, constitu I mean, look at this. Seriously, the supreme law of the land, the Constitution. I mean, some of the questions, honestly, I tweaked them to make them a little harder because some of the... The choices that were created in the West Ada test of this were like, it's like, what is the supreme law of the land? My big toe, you know? <laughs> no, it's not that one. I'm pretty sure, you know, it's a pretty sizable toe, but I don't think so. So, you know, actually the one that trips people up the most, I've seen this, even students that are like really super bright and they're like, I'm going to do really well. I'm going to get them all right. Look, flip to number 87 really quick here. We've got Native American tribes. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a heads up on this one. Um, how many of you guys are into the, like, the 3D um, movie Avatar? Okay, right, you know, with the blue, the blue people, right? Bless you. What was the name of, the, the, of that indigenous people on that, the blue people? What was the name of them? The Navi. So therefore, are the Navi a Native American tribe? No. So, I mean, if you've got all these different Native American tribes, and that's not even a complete list. There are lots of Native American tribes. And so when it's like, if you're given a thing like, which of these is not a Native American tribe? The blue people, okay? And they're not listed as Smurfs or, you know, or blue Elvises or anything like that. It's the Navi. Sorry, I gave one away. But it literally, it's like, I would get people with like almost a perfect score on this exam, and they get that one wrong, and like, because you haven't seen the movie. Whatever. Did that happen again? Oh my gosh. Seriously? This happens like every... Okay, you know what? Just hand them back to me. I'm going to give you brand new ones next time. I don't know. I want to make sure you have, like, the whole thing correctly. No, there's twice as much stuff. I hate that. I hate that.
Sorry. We have invaded a planet and destroyed an indigenous forest to waste these papers. Yes, the Navi have been removed from their homes so that I can waste this paper. Oh my gosh, I hate that. All right, we'll go, okay. Yeah, let me get, take away the, ah, these are defective. They are defective. Yes. Oh no, it's not another page. It's like, if you looked at this, it's like seven and then, oh, 19 through 33, and then we skip to 42. You're missing half of the material. Actually, yeah, we'll do a test case. Maybe we'll, should we let you be the ones that like have the incomplete information and see how you do on the test compared to the other class? Okay, I won't do that. That would be mean. Yeah. Oh, so annoying. Because here's the thing, that's happened before. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out, though. Who pointed that out? Thank you for noticing that. Piper, thank you. It's good. Numbers. OK, now we're going to have some fun with free speech. OK, you ready? I'm going to take you through an analysis of First Amendment free speech as it has uh, been looked at by the United States Supreme Court over the case of many, many years and many cases. And we'll do an analysis so that you understand kind of how these things are going. Uh, we start off with, of course, here we go, free speech. There's Uncle Sam holding up the umbrella. Can you just move it so it doesn't cover them? Right? I love my speech because everyone wants to hear me, especially me. But sometimes you get really annoyed with other people speaking. And you're like, can we shut them down? This is actually a very important point because, like, I read the news. And you hear about like people getting canceled. I mean, that's that's one thing as far as like, oh well, I'm not going to be your friend anymore, and you know, you're going to get your, you know, you lose your job and so forth. But on a on a more important thing, like could somebody lose their job uh, because of something they said, um, or could they be punished because of something they said or did? And it's very, very, very interesting. My general take on this is. The First Amendment covers lots and lots of things, and if you don't like certain things, your first inclination may be to just go, I'm going to ignore you. There is that principle, because our country does want to have lots of free speech, and put this down too, because I'm going to elaborate here, and expression. So speech has been already interpreted to mean not just words, but also other forms of expression. Does that make sense? Dance, music, sounds, visuals, art. Got it? Symbols, everything. Yeah, it's all kind of in the package. And I put this slide up there initially to give you a sense that there are different levels of protection, OK? Which will, we will finish. And I'm going to actually give you some examples. Another thing to think of, going back to, let's see, oh, I had it in an earlier one. Is that, is that important balance? Sometimes you'll have uh, somebody's free speech rights um, co coming into somebody else's interests or somebody else's rights, and so you get this balancing thing. And sometimes it's like where it is makes all the difference. For example, this is easy. Where do you have more free speech? In a public school or a public park? Park, of course, yeah, because a park is like, hey, it's in a park. And you're, when you're in the school, there's two really big things that impact and potentially limit uh, your range of speech and the content of your speech. One, the educational environment, the all-important educational environment, right, which is really helpful for me because that allows me to shut people up when they're interrupting me while I'm trying to teach. 
Exactly. So because in the weighing and balancing things and so forth, we're not even talking about the content, it's just like impacting other students' ability to learn in that particular thing. Also, the other component is children. 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 You are still deemed to be children. When you go off to college, hopefully, I used to say this with a lot of confidence, although I'm not too sure right now in some campuses, hopefully when you go to college campuses, there's more free speech going on, and there's not as much concern of, oh, you don't want to have that go by the children's ears. You know what I'm saying? As in, like, sometimes I like a, I'll be, like, driving along going, ha, I understand what that bumper sticker means, but if I were a parent, I really wouldn't want to have to explain. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, but you do know. So you're lying. So, you're, so, you're, so uh, children uh, learn not to trust you anymore. Right? They ask. Exactly, they ask. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's an interesting twist. So uh, with that in mind, right, and we'll actually get to some uh, school cases because there's, those are fairly helpful. But to just kind of give you a little bit of a context of, like, what's okay, what's not okay. I like to use the sample of, can you wear this on a shirt at school? Okay? Because sometimes it's interesting. If you wear this on a shirt at school, some people might look at it and go, huh, but do you have the right to wear that? Depending on what is on there. So for example, here's an easy one. We've already covered the political and religious, the highest uh, protected one. Can someone wear a shirt that says, vote for Trump? That's, that's political speech, okay? Can someone wear a shirt that says, uh, you know, uh, I believe in God? That's a religious expression, okay? Those are pretty easy ones, right? Those are highly protected. And we'll see as we go through here, in fact, one of the important cases, the Tinker case, is going to be one where students are ex exhibiting political speech in a school, the school uh, punishes them for it, goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, surprise, surprise, maybe not for you guys, they actually win the case. Okay? But let's change it up a little bit here, because the, it's supposed to be neutral. This one's a little bit more problematical. So can a student wear a shirt in a public school? Now granted, private schools are going to be a little bit different. There's a little bit, private schools might be a little bit more like, this is my house. So if, could you say to somebody in your house, uh, no, you got to go. You got a little bit more control over that. But public schools are open to everyone. So we use that as an example. So could somebody wear a shirt that says, worship Satan? In a public school, you're like, you're like I, I hope not. No, no, I don't want that. I don't want that umbrella to be, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, because that's, yeah, hello, yeah, I mean, hello, yeah, that's, that fits under the religious part, okay? Oh, it, trust me, I'm going to be taking it quite far. Caden's like, I'm going to come up with even more examples <laughs> than Mr. Hanson. Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, this is, this is the part where it's kind of like, Warning, Mrs. Anderson, uh, these creative students might be wearing all kinds of interesting things at school. You know, I mean, it's all, all I mean, artistic. I, I'll tell you a story. Artistic. Uh, when I was uh, teaching uh, my very first full-time job, oh my gosh, I had to take a year off after that, was um, teaching seventh graders. It was early in my career. I'm like, <laughs> it was hard. And it was fascinating, though, because I was, had just left the, the law to go into teaching. And um, I was teaching seventh graders at South Junior High in, in Boise School District. And I remember the principal came to talk to me after school the first day of school. And he wasn't asking, like, how my day went or anything like that. He wanted legal advice. He did. Because uh, the vice principal in the school had sent a girl home who showed up with green hair. And you're like, what? What? Um, the vice principal looked at the green hair and was like, that is awfully distracting to the other students in a learning environment. Okay? And of course, the student's mom was very upset because the student's mom had agreed that they felt that that was an artistic expression of the student's, you know, you know, style and so forth. And so, how was that going to play out? She got an attorney 
for through the um, ACLU. You can write that down. Go ahead and write this down. You might as well, because uh, the ACLU is going to jump in to a lot of these uh, uh, civil rights cases. They're like volunteer attorneys. You know, they collect donations. American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. Okay, and they tend to look at. They, they're not as much. <laughs> I mean. They're not going to uh, defend your Second Amendment rights. That's probably going to be another group that's going to get in. The ACLU tends to think of them as like civil liberties, civil rights, but more left. Okay? Although, yeah. Anyway, they got in a, a civil liberties union, an ACLU attorney, and they filed a lawsuit immediately in this, uh, the Idaho courts uh, saying that the school should not be allowed to prevent a kid from learning on the basis of their artistic expression, their green hair. And the principal wanted to know how, how, I, how, how I saw this coming down. And I'm like, oh, not a lot of pressure, <laughs> and so forth. And ultimately, I saw it as did the attorney for the Boise School District. They felt like they weren't going to win. And so they, they basically like, retreated. And it was interesting because I remember the principal came into a staff meeting early on after the school and the school district retreated and the girl was able to come back to school. They're like, okay, <laughs> we got something interesting that's going to happen over the next week or two, and in fact it did. There were lots of children that had gone out and gotten their hair colored in time for school. It was sort of like, we're going to show them. So, I mean, it was, it was just like, it was just, it was so colorful. <laughs> it was so colorful. There was like hair color all over the place and so forth. There, you were a friend. That was good. And so, the teachers, we were told, you know, just focus on the education, right? Focus on the education. So, I mean, that's probably going to fit in here as artistic, right? So, here's another thing. You know, if it's artistic, but it's, I don't know, if it's, like, on fire, like, I don't know, <laughs> like something out of, like, Catching Fire or whatever, or the Hunger Games. I mean, you've got a flaming outfit. <laughs> You got a flaming outfit, a Katniss. Could you like put a? Could you douse out your like you know flaming outfit thing and so forth? It could be a little bit too much. Can you wear a shirt that advertises your favorite fast food restaurant? Probably, yeah. It's it's legal and everything and so forth. Well, it gets problematic as we'll see once you kind of mix things up later a little bit when you take a mixture of component parts where something has got political but it's got illegal components too. So for example, in the state of Idaho, if you opted to wear at a public school a shirt that said smoke pot, advocating an illegal activity, I think that would not be okay. All right, change it up a little bit. Buy pot. That's still an illegal activity in Idaho. How about this one? Buy pot when you go to Oregon. You're advocating an activity that would otherwise be illegal in Idaho, but is legal in the state of Oregon. How about just a marijuana leaf? It's artistic, but... <laughs> you know what, pot, this is, the Queen of England has had to deal with this for so many years. I don't know if the law is in England and so forth, but when you're the Queen of England, <coughs> excuse me, when you're the Queen of England and you go to various different places, all these little children or people come up to you and hand you these lovely bouquets. Pot advocates love to put marijuana fronds into the mix of uh, floral uh, no, 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 but just because they're sort of like, <laughs> we got a pot leaf in there, <laughs> you know, right? How about this one? Shh. This one is, this one's actually pretty easy. Raise your hand if you think this is okay. Someone wears a t-shirt saying, legalize marijuana. Yeah. Does that pull it up to the political speech there? Legalize marijuana and then smoke your brain until it's just like a charred ruin of its former self. Yeah. yeah. No, it's like, 
So, so I've you've, got, you've got this mixture of things, all right? So how about this one? Is this going to be a problem? Okay. Um, if somebody wears a shirt that says, um, you know, go Aztec religion. Is that, is that like, is that religious protection? How about if it says a particular point of the Aztec religion and it says so on the shirt? I want to kill you and rip your beating heart out of your chest and offer it to the divinities above. <laughs> I know, you have to, you know, get a little really close. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, does that start to look like maybe it's being drawn down here and not as much religious protection? When we, get, when we get into the particulars of things, that's when you'll see that like sometimes, it's, sometimes it pulls it up, sometimes it pulls it down, and so you get this multi-dimensional analysis going on here. Um, defamatory. Did we get the definition of defamatory? Okay. What's defamatory then? Okay. S without proof. Say, make sure you have this. Saying something that you know is untrue about them. It's libel if it's printed. It's slander if it's spoken. Either way, it's all defamatory. It has to be published, spoken, or printed. And it's got to be either false, or the person who's doing it should know that it's false. Okay? And it's got to harm their reputation. So if somebody comes along and goes, you're still smart. <laughs> You know, I suppose in some groups of people are like, oh, I hate smart people. I think less of them. I mean, like, give me a break. If it's true, if it's true, shh, can you defame somebody with something that is true? No. No. Because it's not defaming. It's a false statement. Or sh you should know that it's false. Then you're not being careful. Yeah, if you just make something about something, you're like, I see you, and I'm just going to accuse you of being a thief. Hello? That's not good. In fact, here, put this down. You ready? Write this down. Defamatory speech is going to be uh, measured differently depending on who the victim is and who, it, who is, and you'll see this actually in a particular case, who's going to receive more protection against defamatory speech or from defamatory speech? People, private individuals that hardly anybody knows, or well-known public figures. <laughs> Write this down. Private individuals. Uh, not well-known individuals. Because if well-known public figures, if somebody says, Donald Trump is a blankly blank blank blank. I mean, I just said blankly blank blank blank. Donald Trump is well-known. He has an opportunity to respond to it, and he will. Okay. And people will have an opportunity to kind of size it up. But if they say, Lizzie Adams, and people are like, Lizzie Adams? I didn't hear anything about Lizzie Adams. It must be true. So people who are not well known are protected more from defamatory speech. Okay? Translation, sometimes you're going to be able to get away with a lot more nasty sayings against a public figure. Not always, but sometimes. Okay? Hand. Yes. Okay? Hand. Yeah, I know. I hate it when the news, news media are like, according to sources. Yeah. Anonymous sources and so forth. They have to be, they have to be careful. I would say this, general observation. Um, in America, there's a lot more free speech. In Britain, they're much more protective uh, of individuals, and so there's a little bit less free speech because they don't want uh, stuff to happen about it. It's much easier to get a lawsuit against somebody that way. Okay, illegal uh, activities and so forth. That's fairly straight uh, forward. Obscenity, I think we got, did we, didn't we get the definition up there before? We did. So something that is obscene is predominantly associated with things having to do with lust, lust right? 
It's not pure and love and positive emotion. It's just simple base biological desires. But you're like, well, that helps populations to grow. Anyway, whatever, you know. You're like, nah, stop it. But I mean, yeah, so stop it. But it's, like, it's difficult. Because, okay, here we go. Here we go. Here's the example, because this came up some years ago. Boise wanted to put in a nudity ordinance. They wanted to restrict public nudity, as in lots of flesh being apparent upon one's viewing. Do you understand that? Specifically, they were looking at trying to craft an anti-nudity ordinance that would make it really hard, if not impossible, to set up, say, nude dancing facilities. Okay? Sounds like a commercial enterprise. Or is it an obscene enterprise? So here's, oh, there we go. It's artistic. Oh my gosh. What kind of dancing? Is there some dancing that is more artistic? And is there other dancing that is more, what was the word we used? Purient. <laughs> Intending to uh, advance someone's lustful desires. Okay? Which of these is more lustful? Ballroom dancing or twerking? Ballroom dancing. Okay. It's like, what was that? The footloose? Or dirty dancing? Yeah, footloose, yeah. It's just dancing. So anyway, um, you can write this down, the Boise Nudity Ordinance. You can write this down because this actually came up. And ultimately, Boise, I think they put one in, but they had to limit it. They didn't like, ma want to make it too broad, okay? Because obviously, you don't want to impact, like, private dwellings. Who's going to determine what the nudity rules are or not in a private dwelling? The people in that private dwelling. Now, here's a little bit of a proviso on that, limitation and so forth. Sometimes you have to keep your, your curtains drawn because you have a big plate glass window that looks right out onto the street, okay? There is that consideration that if you're walking along a street with little children, you don't want to go, oh my gosh, you know, ah. You understand that? Okay. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> So it's the same thing as like, I mean, something that was so innocent as in, maybe you guys will be in the same situation. Someday you're driving in a vehicle and you're like, I've got a little kid in the back of the vehicle. Maybe you were that kid. And you just want them to be calm and so you put a video on. Right? So you've got, you know, like Aladdin or some other kind of thing on the video screen. Well, the kid in the back of the vehicle can see that. That's cool. But what is also apparent is, other people in other vehicles can see that. So is there a limit on what you can show in your vehicle if you're driving down the street and other cars potentially could see it? Well, no, I mean, here's the thing. Maybe instead of kids in the back, you've got some something else on the screen. So here you go. There were some who said, look, Boise State, Boise State University said, you be careful, do not make that anti-nudity ordinance too broad because we wouldn't want you to restrict legitimate artistic forms of nudity. And you're like, what's artistic? Think the top of the Sistine Chapel, right? I mean, one of the most holy places within all of uh, the Catholic Church, naked people on the ceiling, okay? So at BSU, they have art classes. How many of you guys are interested in going into art? So one of the basic things with respect to like art classes, particularly university level, not the Strosky's art class here at North Star. It, you will not see this taking place in a high school art class, where instead of you know, drawing still life like melons, you draw, oh dear. Uh, <laughs> you're drawing, you draw live figures. Now, live figures in a high school setting would be somebody who is clothed. 
But in a college setting, in a college setting, you are going to have, and maybe some of the students who are having a hard time paying tuition will make a little bit of extra money this way, you will have live nude models. Understand that. Now, what is the purpose? Is that, who should I ask? Caden, all right. Is the purpose of having nudity in a, with a live nude, live nude model um, who moves and so forth, and then the, the, the students, uh, the undergrads or grad students, whatever, are doing sketches and so forth as the person is moving around. Is that predominantly artistic or obscene? That's why they signed up for the class. They did not sign up for the class to see nudity in a lustful manner and so forth. But I mean, here's the deal. In the mind of, how many of you know somebody that if they just see something that, or even they, even a neutral word, they're just like, their head goes straight to the gutter. They take the lowest, most demeaning, base thing, right? You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you know somebody, and hopefully they're not in this class. Okay. I mean, literally, it's like, you, you can't even, like, have a conversation because they'll just go, that's what she said. And you're like, oh, my gosh, seriously? Exactly. Michael Scott. Think Michael Scott. He would, he would look, he would go through an art gallery, right? He would go to the Disney Chapel, he would look up at the ceiling and go, <laughs> So... So here is what, see if this, if this flies with you. Can a, what do you call it, a gentleman's club? Can a gentleman's club, which has music, think of the music that might be playing, and uh, let me see, maybe some firemen's poles and some people dancing around the firemen's poles. Can they turn that? into a constitutionally protected artistic venue if they put on the tables lots of drawing pencils and paper. So that the customers, instead of being lustful uh, uh, um, you know, people, they're actually going to be just, they're art students. How many of you guys are like, oh yeah, that works. That, that's good. What's that? Oh, no, it's, it's commercial and so forth, but what is still, oh, what is the purpose of that gentleman's club? Oh, there you go, obscenity. Okay. All right. Primarily trying to elicit that sort of thing. Now, it's interesting. Yes, go ahead. Yes. It is interesting because, and some of you guys know the answer to this question, Congress at one time when the Internet was first getting started, and it's like, oh, my gosh, there's all kinds of stuff that's out there on the Internet. Boy, howdy. They tried to put a total ban on pornography. Okay? No, they were like, they're going to put a total ban on it. Pornography that is shared, used between, and you have to click that says you're old, that you're old enough. Um, adults sharing with adults things that are of a obscene manner. Did that work? No, the Supreme Court stepped in and said, no, I'm sorry, even that speech is going to be protected. Basically, and you see it up here already, the only ones that are prevented, period, from being included in a pornography website and so forth is child pornography. And that is quite clear, because the idea is that the people involved there, as the, those who are on display, are not old enough to know what they have gotten into, and therefore, it is not like you're old enough and you can make these choices whether you're the participant or the viewer or whatever. So that's why they've come in very, very strongly here, and there is no room for that whatsoever. You understand? Yeah. Um, and that's, this is a very important one. I'm actually I'm going to get into some of that. I'll give you a specific case I'm going to give you guys today. Um, because it's sort of like if somebody kills somebody, um, now they're going to be in trouble for killing them. What if they say as they're killing them, die you blankety blank blank, and they focus on a particular 
a feature of their gender or gender persuasion or ethnicity or so forth. A lot of times then that additional speech part, that hate component, could mean an enhanced penalty. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? So it's really, really interesting and it's very, very controversial. It's not super highly protected. It's not like it, it, Adolf Hitler saying, walking around saying that he hates Jews and wants them all to die is not going to be really highly protected political speech. Okay? Yeah. It's going to perhaps receive some. In this country, for the most part, people are like, you just kind of got to ignore it. If you have it in a high school setting or something like that, it could fit into bullying. Hate speech in a bullying context in a high school or an elementary school or middle school could be prohibited in the sense that that creates quite an impairment of the educational learning environment for those kids that are in there. Does that make sense? In other words, the kind of, the kind of garbage that you hear outside of school and you're like, just keep walking. You don't have to do that in a public school. The public schools have a lot of expectations and requirements to weed out as much of that stuff to create a positive learning environment. Does that make sense? No, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why you don't do that. It's like early in my, early in my teaching career, it's kind of like we're going to have a discussion of gender roles, okay, and politics and, and so forth. And it's kind of like, well, let everyone speak and so forth. But you know what? Do you know people that when they open up their mouth, they say something, it's just like so bad, you just want to punch them? But when you're having a discussion in a high school setting, you really don't want that to be part of the settlement of the issue. You know, usually raising hands as opposed to throwing punches. Nevertheless, twice early in my career, there was discussion of gender and so forth, and both times a boy said something really ill-considered, stupid, and both times before I could intervene, a girl had gotten up and clobbered him right in the face, okay? And no, you don't want that, no. No, not in the class setting, you know. Outside. Oh, there we go. Yeah, outside. You're like, just you wait. Yeah, yeah, literally, sometimes if somebody says something, it's like, okay, we're going to keep it calm, but I can't protect you once you get past the doors and out beyond the school. Okay? Does that kind of help? Yes, go ahead. Shh. I'm glad you're not going to. <laughs> and here's the problem. Sometimes it's interesting. In the artistic component, comic speech, it's a very, very artistic thing. A lot of comedians, I know, a lot of comedians today, you talk to comedians and they're like, oh my gosh, everyone is so super sensitive. You just can't tell a joke at all. Because it is going to be, it, it's not going to be seen as like comic, ha ha ha, artistic. Shh. If you tell a joke, particularly if you're not from that particular group that it, it, the joke is like intended uh, having to do with, it brings it down. And so, I mean, and, and so we're mostly we're talking about livelihoods because if a comic tells too many jokes that are considered like anti this, 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 and this, they might, yeah, well, not even defamatory. It's just sort of like, that's just rude. You know, don't hire them anymore. Don't, don't, don't watch the movies. Cancel them. I mean, like, yeah, it's like, forget about it. All right, now, um, yeah, we'll get to a national security. Understand this. It's like, I was, just, I was just trying to put the nuclear launch codes out there. No, you can't put the nuclear launch codes out there. Could be. I mean, you know, if you're doing it historically and so forth, we'll get to a good example of, like, the news media talking about some top secret things. Sometimes the top secret things aren't necessarily... 100% totally uh, protected, because sometimes the top secret thing is like they're, the, the government's trying to cover up some stuff that they don't want to come out, they don't want to see the light of day, because it'll make them look bad. So, what about what? What about Cerberus? I don't know what it is. I don't know. He's talking about some top secret thing. 
I don't, I don't know. I don't know. All right, now. Whew. All right. Yeah, it was colder in here before the thermal units came in. That's, that would be you guys. All right. Um, so let's go through some specific things. The United States of America, we have a flag. People have fought and died for our country, fought and died to protect our flag and so forth. Our flag is highly venerated. Can our flag be protected? Write this down. Flag protection laws. You can write this down. There was a law that was passed by the United States government, I want to say like in the 90s, and it was a flag protection law. And it was similar to some of the things you see in other countries, basically saying, okay, you, you got free speech, you got political speech, but keep your hands off the flag. Okay? Now, we have a long tradition in our country of people doing things like this as a way of protesting whatever government action that is going on, they burn the flag as part of that. Now, a couple things are important to know this. This guy is burning this flag right here. It's not necessarily a fire danger if you can look around, there's a bunch of concrete and so forth there. So it's a protest fire. He hasn't stolen it from anyone. I think he borrowed it or bought it or whatever. So he's brought that in there. Is that, raise your hand if, like, he, if somebody were to do that and you were to see that taking place, you would be not too happy about it. All right, hands down. Okay? Now, it is interesting because in the context, how many of you guys, like, have ever participated in a, and they literally, they call it this, a flag retirement ceremony? It's quite different. Okay? So if a flag's been flying a long time and it gets kind of worn out and so forth, you're not supposed to wad it up and throw it in the weekly uh, trash pickup. No. You conduct a retirement ceremony, which basically is, shh, it involves burning the flag, but it's quite different than the intention here. The intention here is to make a political statement that is very, um, I'd say, in your face. It's going to get some attention and so forth. All right? Can this be banned? Is that, is that too much of a restriction on this guy's wide range of political speech rights and so forth to say he doesn't like this particular thing that's going on with the United States government or that particular thing in the United States government? Um, or can he in still include in that burning the flag as part of his political protest message. We'll spend a little bit of time on this one before we move on. Yep. Does this I would say it probably would. Okay? Because there is going to be a Supreme I'm going to give you the Supreme Court decision on this particular US law. And I would say it would also apply to state flags, I think, government flags. Okay? What's that? If depends on where you are. If you are in Iran and you try to burn the Iranian flag, well, you don't have much uh, civil rights there to begin with, and good luck with that. Iranians, when they're protesting against the United States of America, they love burning American flags and so forth. I mean, that's just like, you know, standard around the world. You know, burn an American flag. Sometimes you mix it up a little bit. You make an effigy of the president, and then you wrap them in a flag, and then you burn it. You know, sometimes you give them, you know, put cookies in their hand. Anyway, it's just like whatever. Yes, yes. Okay. So, anybody want to chime in on this one? What do you think? Should we be able to ban flag burning? Raise your hand if you think we should ban flag burning. There's plenty of other free speech opportunities out there. You know, be more specific, be a little bit more clear as to exactly what policy are you upset about? Because this is sort of like you're kind of throwing everything away. How many of you guys are like, no, let him, you know, I don't like what he's doing, but and whatever, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, and that's kind of how, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one because there's some other really juicy stuff coming along later. Unless anyone's got an opinion, you want to share an opinion? Okay, go for it. No, that is a theft, yeah, it's criminal law. And trust me, as we go for, through here, we'll see that sometimes one of the things that people like to do to uh, get effective speech communication out there is to do something that's really going to get people's attention. And sometimes it's going to be really, really making people angry. I'll, and frankly, sometimes it's like their, their allies in that particular um, venture will say, really? You, you want to attract more people to our side? Well, don't do that. Because... 
if you see, I mean, how many of you guys, if you see somebody burning the United States flag, you're like, I'm not even going to listen to you, pal. Uh, you've kind of, like, uh, you've already kind of taken a step backward. Whatever your particular uh, political point is you're trying to make, you've lost it on me right here because I don't really like kind of how you're doing that. Does that make sense? And yet, write it down, the Supreme Court prohibited flag burning bans. Do you see the double negative there? In other words, they said this is a protected form of political speech. Okay? It was a close, it was a close vote. And it's one of those ones where you look and you're like, other countries, other democracies have prohibited burning of their country's flag. It gets kind of problematic. You know, and frankly, I mean, if this guy, if he really wanted to make a point, he would want to maybe, like, get arrested. So he would, like, do something else in order to get arrested and attract more attention and so forth to the cause. Because the news media might go, I'm not going to be paying much attention to that. You're just burning the flag. Ooh, Forget it. We're not going to cover you. But if they, I don't know, if they burn down a Kentucky Fried Chicken, would that attract more attention? Now, of course, here's the thing. If they burn out a Kentucky Fried Chicken to show how angry they are at what is going on, is that necessarily going to help their cause, or will it potentially hurt their cause because now they're inflicting punishment on the poor KFC franchise owner that was like, I just want to sell chicken. You know? Yes? And that's, I mean, that's the, that's the danger, that's the danger of some speech uh, uh, things as if, or political uh, proponents as if you kind of muddy it up too much with stuff that really starts making people irritated, you know, and, and you guys got plenty of examples and so forth. Um, I mean, if you're talking about Colin Kaepernick wanting to uh, focus attention on the plight of African Americans in the country today, is that an issue? Sure, it's an issue. Hello, it's been an issue for a long time. So when the national anthem is being sung at a sporting event and he doesn't take the, the expected prototypical sort of thing of just standing there or putting your hand on your heart or singing along with the anthem and so forth and instead kneels, what kind of reaction is that going to have? And that was a fascinating one because is that a public issue or is that a private issue? An NFL game, if you know what I'm talking about, Colin Kaepernick was a quarterback. I think he was doing that when he was with San Francisco 49ers at the time. Is that a public or private? It's private. Because the NFL is a private organization. So who ultimately establishes the rules within the NFL as to the behavior of their employees? The NFL. And so they've been dealing with that issue for quite some time because they're trying to, it's kind of like, we, we want these people to be our fans and continue to participate as well as we want these players to participate and so forth. And yet we're also concerned about this this component of the audience who would be offended if that is taking place and you're kind of like, oh my gosh, it's just a football game. And yet, yeah, exactly. So some of them, one of the solutions was do the anthem for the people in the crowds and then the players can come out of the locker rooms and play a football game. It's gotten very interesting. Free speech and political opinions and everything, it's just like all in there. Isn't it fun? You guys got to deal with all this stuff. It's fun. All right, now, I'm going to give you a scenario, and you decide whether or not this girl's speech, are you ready? Whether or not this girl's speech could be punished. Michelle Carter case. I think, I, I don't think it's actually still going through the courts. I don't think it's still going through the courts, but it created an interesting case. Here are the facts. You ready? The Michelle Carter case. Uh, who? No. I've got 10th uh, graders. Um, Michelle Carter. This is a very, very interesting one. Michelle Carter was texting a close friend of hers. And in fact, arguably, you could say that they were boyfriend, girlfriend. Okay, you're not going to like this. You're not going to like this at all. Okay, why not? Because the nature of the text between her and the guy, did you see a documentary about this? Yeah. 
Um, was he was very, very depressed. He was suicidal. And ultimately,